Hey everyone, how's it going? It's your boy Vidu Vids in the pub today, and I am with none other than Yaron Brook. Uh, thank you, Yaron, for coming oh, pleasure. on. Pleasure. Thanks really for having appreciate me. that. Uh, Yaron is the uh, chair of the board yep. of the Iron Rand Institute and the host of the Yaron Brook Show. Yaron Brook, uh, I've been watching your stuff on uh, YouTube. I've read your book on Audible, <laughs> uh, which is available, by the way. Um, and to to say that you are a someone who promotes the free market would be an understatement. You are, I would say, the most purest form of capitalist or free market advocate uh, there is. And that's why I want to speak to you because sure. I myself uh, consider myself a libertarian and I know you've got some issues with that word and yep. maybe we can explore, yep. uh, uh, explore, explore that later on. But you are someone who advocates for the philosophy of Ayn Rand. Yes. How would you describe Ayn Rand's philosophy in a nutshell uh, for those people who may not be familiar with Ayn Rand. Sure. First, you have to understand that Ayn Rand was indeed a philosopher. So the, this is a philosophy. It's not just a political theory or mm. an economic theory. It actually deals with all the basic uh, foundations of all ideas. Uh, and, and she has something to say, important and new, I think, to say in every field of philosophy. In, in, in metaphysics, uh, Ayn Rand says reality is what it is. Uh, reality uh, is not a function of your consciousness, not a function of what you wish it to be, what you want it to be, yeah. but it's also not a function of some other external consciousness, right? It's not a function of some god who, who dictates how reality and, you know, creates miracles. It is what it is and it functions based on the law of causality. A is A, to quote Aristotle. Things are what they are. And we as individuals have the tool to know that reality as it is, and that tool is human reason. We use our senses to discover, get information about reality. We can integrate that information and we can abstract from it. But all human knowledge, all human knowledge is a product of our reason. Right. There is emotions in our tools of cognition and there's no revelation. We're not, we don't commune with some other dimension, whether it's uh, in, a, in a platonic sense or religious sense. We can't commune with another dimension and get truth from there. Truth is here and we can access it. So, and so, only, yeah. only individuals can reason. And the whole, the whole point of an individual's life is the pursuit of your own happiness, the pursuit of your own success as a human being, to live your life for yourself. So she was an egoist uh, in, in morality. So she believed that you shouldn't sacrifice yourself to other people. And sacrifice means here giving up a high value for a low value, making yourself worse off in the, lo in the long run. And it, you shouldn't ask other people to sacrifice for you. You should live for yourself over the long run and the way to live for yourself mm. is to use your tool of cognition, your tool okay. of knowledge. So a couple of things there, the word sacrifice, I think this word has been confused yes. many times. So for yes. example, if I say I want a better body, I'm going to sacrifice eating a cake yeah. and someone thinks, oh, that's a good thing, right? Yeah. I'm going to sacrifice a bad yeah. meal for yeah. a good one. But you're saying- but That's a misuse of the term. Right. So it's clearly you're say, what you're really saying is the value of having a great body is greater than the value of the cake. Cake, right. And I'm giving, so, so you don't give, you know, there are lots of examples of this. You know, people say, oh, I sacrificed not going to the movies to stay home with my kids. Really? Mm -hmm. Your kids are more valuable to you. See, once you do that, then you, you, you abandon the, the meaning of sacrifice. Sacrifice is supposed to be painful. Sacrifice mm -hmm. is supposed to set you backwards. Uh, it's, it's not supposed to make you better off. It's not a self-interested thing to do. When you give up the cake, it's mm. clearly in your self-interest to give mm. up the cake. So, but people conflate the term because they don't want you to know what sacrifice really means. I mean, when we use they, the term sacrificial lamb, who actually in reality wants to be a sacrificial lamb, like actually gets slaughtered. Yes, you know? and, yeah. and that's at the end. At the end, sacrifices about Jesus on the cross dying for other people's sins, not for his own. Mm. Maybe you deserve to die for your own sins for other people's sins. Now that's mm -hmm. a sacrifice. Yeah. Now, of course, you know, he gets resurrected and all that <laughs> stuff. But, but the idea yeah, yeah. Of, of you have to give up something important to you for something less important or for nothing, that is what morality, according to the altruists, is really about. Mm -hmm. That's what's noble and law. For example, giving up the cake to build your body. That's not, nobody thinks in terms of morality. I do. Because I say what's, it, what's moral here mm. is that you're taking care of yourself, and that's moral. Right. But conventional morality says that's not morality. Morality is how you take care of other people. Morality is, is, is sacrificing your body to take care of other people. Why are you spending so much time working out when you could be helping those people over there who are starving and, and, and dying? 
That's true morality. That's what makes you noble. That's what makes okay. you a saint. Right? So you go back to what you said earlier. You said human reason. This is how we find out what is the truth and yes. what we should uh, base our life towards. And every individual should be an egoist. So I'm going to do what's best for me. Yes. Would you recognize that our, uh, every, not everyone can reason properly or, or have the tools to reason, i.e. They, maybe they're not trained, maybe they live in a society where certain values are higher than other values, for example. So can we really rely upon individuals to figure out for themselves what is in their self-interest? Because we say self-interest. But what if? So the question is this, is everybody capable of reasoning? And, yeah. and, and my view is absolutely yes. It doesn't matter how intelligent you are. We have the brain too. You, you have, we have, we, you know, yeah. that's what makes us human. Sure. What makes us human, according to Aristotle, we're the rational animal. Right. So we have the capability to reason. And then it's incumbent upon you as an individual to break the chains that society puts you in, to, to, to get educated. Now, it's true that today our educational system is so bad mm. that we're not teaching kids to think for themselves. We're not teaching kids to reason. And, and surely in certain countries or, or in certain eras when let's say the church or religion was dominant, it was very hard for people to mm. reason because in a sense they were brainwashed. Even as, were you know, physical, the, Je yeah. the Jesuits used yeah. to say, give me a child by the age of five, they're mine. You know, mm. you know you, I, I brainwashed them completely. And there's a sense in which that is true. Yeah, yeah. So yes, in very oppressive cultures, you could, you could argue that it, you know, it's hard to blame the people of North Korea for not living their lives based on rationality, because they can't, right? They'd be killed if they did. Mm. But <clears throat> most of us today, luckily, but certainly in the West, live in relatively free countries. Our educational system is bad, but it's not so bad as it cripples your mind in a way that you cannot. It's incumbent upon an individual to discover their own capability to reason, to take care of themselves, to discover their values, to break ties with the irrational, to break ties with the past when it's a bad past, mm. to break ties with society when society is bad, to break ties with politics when the politics is, 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 is bad, and to build an independent life for themselves to the extent okay. that, they, that, that the world around us makes it possible. So key to Ayn Rand's philosophy is objectivism. You've got to be objective. Objectivism is the name of her philosophy. Is the name. Yes. But if, you, if I'm going to decide what's best for me, then surely that's subjective. Like, it is, it, it, like it, what's good for me may not be good for you. Subjective is a very dangerous word and in 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 ultimately, I think, a, a, a tricky word, right? What does subjective actually, uh, actually mean? Mm -hmm. Whatever I feel like, whatever, you know, what does what mm. what, what it reflect to? Now, certainly individual. Your values are yours. Subjective implies that whatever values you choose, it's fine. And Almost I'm saying no. Taste or preference. Kind of well, like. it's taste or preference or emotion or, you know, I, I, I want to be a Christian today. I want to be a Jew tomorrow. I want to, I want to, I want to, you know, uh, steal uh, something. Hey, it's good for me. And I'm sa I say no. First, there are certain principles, moral principles, that are good for everybody. Qua human beings. Human beings have a particular nature. Mm. So think of you as a biological being, right? Clearly, certain foods are good for you and certain foods are not. That's why you're giving up the cake to build a body because you've identified scientifically. Sugar is probably not consistent with mm. me being healthy and being, but let's assume that's true. Yeah. Right? There's a science. I'm saying the same is true of, of, of life. To live, you must do certain things. All human beings must do these things. Certain things are bad for you, certain things are good for you. Mm. How you apply them to you specifically is going to be individual, not subjective, but individual. Wow. You will choose a different career than me. But we both probably identify that career is important. And that we both identify that we better take our career seriously if we want yeah. to be successful in life. Taking your career seriously, for example, is a universal value. It is a value that's required for a successful human life and is objective in that sense. And Ayn Rand has three cardinal values, you know, values that I think every human being yeah. is necessary. Reason. If you don't use reason, if you don't use your mind, you're going to screw up your life. Mm. It doesn't matter where, when you're going, to, you're going to screw up your life. So reason is universal. All human beings have the capacity. And people who live in societies where they're not allowed to use their reason, their lives are screwed up. Yeah, you know, it's, 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 yeah. a, it's a main reason their lives are screwed up. Reason purpose. You have to have a purpose in life. You have to have a goal. You have to, you have to know what you want. You have to integrate your life around what you want. Most of us integrate our life around career. 
about a career that we want to do. Career and or family for, for most people. Well, it could, you know, nobody really integrates their life around family. Maybe some some women do, particularly yeah, more right. traditional, right. In, more traditional families. But the fact is that that family requires a certain effort, usually for for. Um, um, uh, parents during 18 years when the kids are growing up but you can't sustain a whole life around family right you can't sustain from beginning to end at the very least you need a good hobby on the side mm -hmm. in order to keep your interest and your intellect and your in your, your reason going and i think most people who say i care most about their family when you ask them well do you spend more time with your family or do you spend more time at work you suddenly discover that they, they their preference based on how much time they spend mm -hmm. is for work and not for family um so reason, purpose, and the third one is self-esteem. You have to have this sense that you belong on this planet. Your happiness is dependent on it. And you have to seek that out. You have to seek out self-esteem. And self-esteem comes from the achievement of values, mm. the achievement of success, rational success. So those are the values that I think are universal. And then the question is, how do you get those values? I was just gonna ask, the first one, reason, I mean, that's pretty, I mean, self-explanatory, but yep. purpose, meaning, all these types of words, they can get a bit fuzzy sometimes for some people. And this is where you see the Jordan Peterson of the yeah. world coming in and they step in and they amaze people and woo people. Like, wow, this guy's amazing. And this is why Jordan Peterson is so successful. Yeah. And the re one of the reasons he's so successful, he's successful for many reasons. One of them is people have a need for meaning. I, I like prefer the word purpose, but mm. people have a meaning, need purpose, yeah. for purpose. Yeah. And he provides them with guidance on how to get one. Now, I don't think his guidance is always good. I don't mm. think his guidance is always the right guidance because I think he's, he's got some philosophical errors right. uh, uh, in his system. But the need for meaning and purpose is unquestionable. All of us have it, and that's why religion is so successful. Mm. It's why John Peterson is so successful. It's why people are so influenced when they read Ayn Rand. It's not, it's not the detail, it's this idea, first and foremost, you know, she provides you with guidance towards a purpose. Mm. And, and look, none of them are contradictory. You need to use reason in order to discover your purpose. And you need to use reason in order to attain your purpose. But you need a purpose. You need, life is too, too many things going on. It's too, you need something mm. to integrate it all. You need a, a direction to your life, right? You, you, you're a communicator. A you love, yeah. you love yeah. communication and you yeah. integrate. You've got a podcast, you've got a, a mm. company maybe, mm. you work for other people. But it's all integrated around this one thing. You love communication. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the thing you do. And you can shift purposes over time. It doesn't have to be one for your whole life. But you need an integrating. And self-esteem is just, it, it is, is we need, in order to be successful in life, right? Everything is dependent on this idea. In order to survive and succeed at living, we need to feel like we belong in this life. We need to feel like this is our home. And, and that comes from this sense of confidence and mm -hmm. sense of, yeah, this earth is mine, right? This is, this is good. I, I can handle this world. I can, I can make my, I can be successful here. Mm. And of course, to actually achieve this, you need virtues that are actions that lead to those values. And Ayn Rand identifies seven. You know, other philosophers might be can uh, you know identify six, nine. Doesn't the point is the focus here is what does it take to be successful in life? What does it take to survive, to thrive, to flourish, and ultimately to be happy in life as a particular biological entity? Right, recognizing that we have an identity, just like everything else in reality. Mm -hmm. it, like you don't go to a cheetah and say, you know, whether you eat or not is subjective. Mm -hmm. eh, today you're gonna eat plants. Yeah. Well, if a cheetah eats plants, they die. Mm -hmm. It's objective, they have to eat animals. And they have to eat animals they can catch and the way they catch them is through speed. Right? Human beings, you can say, oh, you can do whatever you want and you'll be happy. No, there's a certain path to happiness. And, that, mm -hmm. and you, you can't even say, you can do whatever you like and survive. Human beings can't survive even 100,000 years ago without reason. They just, I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I do not have the gene for hunting, <laughs> right? And nobody does. Yeah, yeah. How do we hunt? So if you put a human being and a saber-toothed tiger, one-on-one, -on -one. One -on -one, who game. wins? Right, it's game over. Yeah. Game over, right? But the fact is, last saber-toothed tiger I saw was in a museum. Yeah. And look, at I don't know, eight billion human beings. How do we win that battle? Mm because we build weapons, right. we figured out strategy, we figured out how to beat the saber tooth tiger. If you ask a human being to hunt a bison, I mean, how am I gonna hunt a bison? It's mm. like this massive thing and he runs for the like truck. Yeah. We build traps, we have weapons, we strategize, we work mm. in teams. All of those things require reason, they require okay. ingenuity. So 
very, the very act of survival for human being requires certain principles, and you cannot evade those principles. And to an extent that you do, you die. Okay. So this Maybe is slow death, but you die. So this is one of the last questions on this on this on this subject. Do you think? I mean, the same way we look at communists and say this is utopia. You have this unbelievable trust that the government will provide you with everything and everything will peace and hunky dory. Do you think the same way? It's utopian for Ayn Rand to think everyone, if they only acted with reason, or if we were to create society, and then overnight, if everyone acts with reason, everyone's going to be uh, better off and birds well, will be I chirping. I never, I, well, birds will be chirping. Birds will um, be chirping. That's that is, true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I don't think everybody's better off. I think there's always going to be a certain uh, percentage of the population, very small, I think, tiny, that are going to be worse off. You know, uh, the wife beating drunk is bad off in this society and probably worse off in capitalism because now we. He might be getting uh, NHS and he might get a little bit of welfare and in capitalism, nobody will have anything to do with him. He'd probably just die for it. So, um, you know, no, the Iron Man's, the Iron Man's system says if you take care of yourself, if you engage your reason, if you act rationally, you will have a successful life. You know, barring accidents, barring, you know, hitting yeah, lightning forget, and everything yeah, yeah. like that. But, but, but uh, you know, okay. generally but, you are. But there's nothing utopian about it. And this is the difference with, with communism. I mean, a huge difference is with communism. Ayn Rand's ideas are derived from and consistent with human nature. She doesn't say, this is what I want human beings to be like. I want human beings to be, I don't know, uh, uh, to be a, a, a being that doesn't care about himself. Mm. You, well, you can't survive if you, if you don't care about yourself. She says, no, I want you to care about yourself and I want you to think about what it really means to care about yourself. And to care about yourself means to use your mind and to think about how to, how to produce and how to create and how to take care of your world. So her philosophy is the first philosophy, in my view, that is consistent with human nature. It is consistent with what is mm. truly required for survival. So Christianity and most moral codes, there's morality and there's practicality. And the two do mm. not match up. You can either be moral or you can be practical. You can either make money or you can be moral. You can't do both, I mean, really. Well, I mean, many Christian really. preachers in America... Yeah, well, they, they pretend, right? Yeah, because right. they love making money so much <laughs> that they distort their Christianity to fit that. But, but really, you know, Mother Teresa, who's a saint, and they're not, who was a saint, you know, she was poor, mm. and she suffered, and she struggled, she made other and, she, people and suffer she was well. unhappy, yeah. and she made other people suffer. Well, she tried to help. The claim is she tried to help people, whether she did or not is an open question. And she's a saint. Why? Because she suffered. If she had made millions, if she was driving Rolls Royce while helping other people, then, yeah, yeah. then she wouldn't. Like Bill Gates right now is helping more people than Mother Teresa ever did with his philanthropy. He's not going to be a saint because he's enjoying himself and he's rich. So practical and moral are separate. With objectivism, the practical is the moral, is the moral yeah. and the moral is the practical. Well, why? Because the way morality was derived inductively from experience. So Rand says she could have never have developed her morality 300 years ago. It had to be in the 20th century. Why is that? Because she had to see the Industrial Revolution. She had to see people apply their reason to the problem of human survival on a massive scale. If you go back to Aristotle, to a large extent for Aristotle, reason is interesting, it's a mind game, it's something you do, but it's an end in itself. The Industrial Revolution proves that science, thinking, reason, are an end to human flourishing, are an end to the material problems of right. that human beings engage in. And when we apply our minds, we can create anything. We can, you know, we can create this abundance with which we live. Mm. And sh you needed proof of that okay. in reality. So objectivism is derived <laughs> from reality. It's derived, it, it, you know, uh, um, inductively from the facts of reality. And it's consistent with what works in reality. And if, if I had a, if there was a virtue in, Somebody could show me that that virtue, it didn't work in reality, it actually led you to be miserable, pathetic, to die ultimately. And I'd say, then it's not a virtue, then we made a mistake, we need to cross that off right. and, and have a different virtue. Okay, can someone be an objectivist and disagree with Ayn Rand? Or is she the standard? Well, it depends what you mean by, uh, you know, disagree with Ayn Rand. So, objectivism is her philosophy. It's what she wrote down philosophically. And... It, if you disagree with her philosophy, you can disagree with the application, you disagree with a particular issue, but if you disagree with her on the philosophy, then no, you're not an objectivist. But why do you care? Why right? do I care? Why does anybody care? Oh, right, right, right. Right. My view is, 
you don't need to be an objectivist. I'm not here to convince anybody to be an objectivist. I want you to convince you of the truth. If it turns out Ayn Rand was wrong, then so be it. let's change the stuff. And, but then it's not objectivism. And that's what she wanted. <laughs> she didn't want objectivism to become whatever we thought the truth was in the future. She said, look, objectivism I created, since I won't be there in the future to evaluate whether I agree with you or not on, on what is right or what is wrong, I want this to be called objectivism. If you agree with it, call yourself an objectivist. If you don't say you're influenced by Ayn Rand, you agree with a lot of Ayn Rand, you, you built on Ayn Rand's work and you, you're right. this new thing, but don't call it yourself an objectivist unless you agree with her on the philosophy. Now, you can disagree with her on psychology, you can disagree with her on certain applications to politics or other things. But my point is, you know, I don't encourage people to call themselves objectivists, right? Call yourself a, tr a truth seeker. Mm. Go find the truth. And I'm, I, you know, I, I don't, before I become somebody's friend, I don't interview them and, uh, to decide whether they're... Are you, they, uh, are you an objectivist yeah, yeah. or not? It, Take a you test. Know, yeah. Do you care about the truth? Mm. That is very important to me. So would you be friends with a communist if they no, said... never. Never? Never. I mean, communism is sheer evil. And everybody who is over 25 who is a communist mm. is an evil person because they are evading obvious truths. Okay, but... Okay, but the same way they, I mean, they themselves might be tr uh, seeking the truth. And at this moment in their life, they think Look, communism is the truth. After, so over, after over 100 million people have died. It wasn't real communism. There is no such thing. At some point, every regime that has ever tried this idea, mm. every regime that has approached trying this idea, every regime that is affiliated with this idea has led to nothing but death and destruction. If you are evading that, mm. if you are pretending that doesn't exist, you are doing what I do and consider the essence of evil, so which is evading the facts of reality. You're not a truth seeker. You are. You you've got a theory, and now you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna distort reality to fit your theory. That. But but there's there's nobody on planet Earth today <laughs> over the age of you know let's be generous thirty, mm. who claims to be a communist, who is an honest person. Nobody. That's a big claim. Okay, so would, by, by that oh thing, no, I think it's I think it's one of the easiest. So, I mean, would you say the same thing if I if I yeah. said if somebody came to you and said I'm a Nazi, I'm I'm seeking the truth, I'm I'm experimenting, I'm, I'm figuring it out. Everybody would be horrified. That's true. Why? What's the difference? That's true. Communists killed more, more people than more. Nazis. He says no, Hitler didn't practice it right. You know, it, it, it wasn't real Nazism. It wasn't real Nazism. We didn't really kill that many Jews, and it's all it, it's, yeah. it's really you're fudging the numbers and yeah, stuff. Yeah. You would consider that person dishonest and evil. Why do communists get a pass? Now, I, you know, if you want, I can tell you why communists get a pass. But communists get a pass. They shouldn't. They are Nazis. There is fun, there is absolutely Economic zero. Economic Nazis, you say. They're Nazis in every respect. There is no difference from a moral perspective between a Nazi and a communist. If you claim to be a communist, I will treat you as if you just claim to be a Nazi. You deserve exactly the same treatment. That is very interesting. Now, would you be friends with a Muslim Christian Jew? Because their ideologies arguably have caused a lot of damage as well. So would you be friends I with I mean, it depends on how seriously they took their religion. So if they were serious Muslims, serious Christians, serious Jews, no. Wow, that's I amazing. Feminist? Well, again, it depends what you mean by feminist and how seriously you took feminist, it. Third-way feminist, right? No, I couldn't be friends with a third-way right. feminist. Fair enough. Uh, um, <laughs> I mean, uh, what would be the basis? I believe friendship yeah. is, is one of the most important things in life. I, I'm not friends with a lot of people. I, you know, in my friends, I have to share values. And if, 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 there's, if, if there's no overlap of values, if there's nothing we, we really share, then you know, what Fair would enough. be the point? Now, if somebody was a moderate leftist, if somebody was a moderate Christian, a moderate Jew, a moderate Muslim, Yes, I, c I could imagine being friends with them. Flexibility. Yeah. But, but, yeah. but even then, the friendship would be compartmentalized over certain things, because clearly by being moderate in all but, those things, but, they are compromised. But maybe the Nazi, the communist, whoever, if they became your friend, they, they, being exposed to yourself and the way you live and everything, they, may, they might My think, you know My purpose in what? life is not to convert Nazis and no, communists. No, your purpose might not be that, but just them sp spending time but with But why you. would I even spend time with them? I, I, you know, my life, my, every second of my life is precious. So, okay, so I'll never get it back again. I'll never have another moment. So l let's say, for right? example. So if, if communist is watching this video, good then then maybe i'll convert him yeah but but uh i'm not going to go out of my way to find him and mm. if he comes to me i'm not going to make any effort to convert him. i'm going to tell him his philosophy is the equivalent of a nazi philosophy it's evil it's 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 unthinkable and how can yeah. he live with himself well I, I appreciate that because um i wonder why communists get such a free pass when their death toll far far uh well, you can ask me and i'll tell you okay so before we get into that <laughs> i want to sorry i want to uh, test the your 
Ayn Rand philosophy versus conservatism? Because it's, it's one thing to say communism sucks. Okay, that's pretty easy, right, for people like us. But what about conservatism? Well, I didn't say it sucks. I said it was evil. No, Big yeah. difference. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> nuanced. Well, I'm yeah. just joking. Yeah. I'm not nuanced. Yeah, no, no nuanced. Yeah. <laughs> but um, conservatism. So, so if someone is fiscally conservative, they're like, you know what? I'm for small government when it comes to money and yeah. don't tell me how to spend my money and taxes yeah. and regulation. Yeah. But and this is what I was talking to. Do you know anybody like that? Uh, some people, not really. Like, they, who are serious? Who actually mean it? Well, well, they, well, they say it. They, they're willing to do away with ninety percent of the regulations that the government has imposed, and they and they want to cut taxes dramatically. Potentially, yes. I but mean, conservative usually want to conserve, yeah, and, the, cons and they want to conserve, and they want to conserve the present. They don't want to conserve a hundred years ago. They're not that. Ra that would take radicalism. That would take revolution, but, and they don't believe in a revolution. They want to conserve the present. Sure, but or my, maybe ten years. Ago. But my question is, but they're wimps. But okay, they're wimps. But my question is, with with regards to conservatism, there is this idea that this country or whatever country isn't just a piece of land where we live. It it means something, right? Yes. It has a national history, has a national pride, and you are someone who advocates for free market. So I'm assuming there will be private schools for everyone. And if there are private schools for everyone, there's not a national curriculum where a conservative would be like, you know what, this country, US or UK, these are our values, this is what we stand for. Whether you're an immigrant or a leftist, rightist, you have to believe in this. What would be your answer to the conservative who wants to conserve that national pride or history, whatever, those core values? How scary is that? That some group of politicians are going to decide mm. what the core values that are going to be taught my child are going to be. I mean, that's what's happening today in our educational system, and it is really, really, really so bad. So you would leave it up to individual uh, people? Absolutely. What, but and, then, and this but then, is the problem. But then you get the problem that you could get a, a very radical view of what a, a child's value should be. And there, there comes the indoctrination. You know, you can, you can be into anything. You, know, you either believe in freedom or you don't believe in freedom. And that, okay. it's, it's essentially that. If you believe in freedom's right, in, in, in individuals' rights to, to, to raise but their own if, children, if Nazi, to educate their own Nazi children. Want to, or communists want to as have long a, as they don't use force, the state has no role in intervening in their life. And as long as they're not beating their children, as long as they're not abusing their children, they have a right to educate their children as they see fit. But one could and, argue and that abusing children is not simply physical. It's also once you get into that, then you know maybe maybe by saying something that upsets you, I'm abusing you, and now the state should intervene. These are the arguments against free speech. The, no, the role of the state is to protect us from physical harm, not from mental harm, not from things we don't like or mm. disagree. This is why I, I'm against hate speech laws. I'm against all restrictions on free speech, because that becomes very dangerous and very subjective. What is yes. speech that is okay and what is not? Same with children. Now, I don't think it's a good idea to send your kid to a madras. I don't think it's a good idea to send your kid to a, 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 an Aryan uh, a buddy Nazi school. <laughs> Would be or, interesting. Or for that matter, any, any, yeah, any yeah. school today run by the government that is mm. not quite communist, but on the way there, right? So, so, so my, my, mm. my view is that should be left completely to parents. And look, it, it, there is a challenge in the West, and that is what is the nature of the state? What is the identity of the state? What makes a state a state? And, and, and it's, it's a real problem, and it's, it's, it's a problem you're seeing particularly in Europe. And, I, I mean, and, yeah. and, 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 and this is what makes, I think, the United States unique and where Europe could learn from the United States. The United States is not a place that is defined by borders. It is not a place defined by history. It's not a place defined by color of skin, it's not a, face, a place defined even by religion. The United States is a place defined by a couple of documents. It's a place defined by ideas. The ideas of individual rights, the ideas of liberty, the ideas of freedom, and the idea of reason. The idea of bring everything before reason. That is at the base of the American Declaration I mean, of Independence and Constitution. Uh, disputed, I mean, I know American history is, is, is Slavery and racism. I know people say that all the time, but people well, of course, think, yeah. of course, those things. American American history has lots of warts and it has mm. lots of problems in it. It's not a perfect country by any means, but it was founded on the right ideas, even if they mm. applied them badly. The ideas at the founding right. were the right ideas, and that's what defines America. And that's what makes America unique, and what has made American history, but then I think, unique. For that America is by far the mo the best country in human history and right. has contributed more to, to human life than any other country in human history in spite of its flaws and mm. it has had flaws mm. big ones big slavery one, yeah. being the biggest so b before we get on to the best country in the world so for Europe yeah, for, Europe for Europe, needs yeah. to define an identity 
And, and how, do you, how do you do that? Yes, it, well... So, for example, let's take this country. If I say British, I am British. Yes. So forget about colour of skin, forget about race. Yes. What does British mean? And this, we've had this conversation so many times over the last yeah. 10, 15 years. Yeah. People say it's uh, the parliament, it's Buckingham Palace, it's the Queen, it's the church, it's the this, it's the that. Or is it, or we are a country of immigrants. How do you decide what, what is British and does it even matter? Well, I think it does matter. I think uh, who, who, I think, who I think, decides? Well, I mean, reality decides. Reality no, is always I mean, a decider, I mean, right? That's the you have to identify it in reality. So the question to ask, it's, it's, it's a question of how you approach it. Mm. The question to ask is, 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 is this. What is it? What is it about Britain yeah. that is good? What is it about being Britain that has led to Britain being successful? What is it about Britain right. that we want to perpetuate? Right. And it's not the church, it's certainly not the queen. It's it it it. it but it's it's a it's it's what is it? It's well, the it's okay. my in my view. Okay, right? go for it. It's the Magna Carta. Hmm. It's it's the you know it's the it's a fight for individual rights. It's the abolition of slavery. It's it's certain key, it's an industrial revolution. It's certain key elements. So what is Britain about? Britain is the land. Oh, and it's most importantly in my view, most importantly by far, it's the Scottish and British Enlightenment. It's the 18th century, uh, which led to, of course, the abolition of slavery. Yeah. I mean, yes, Shakespeare yeah. has a role, and you have to think about what about yeah. Shakespeare, yeah. because Shakespeare is a very mixed bag when right. it comes to when it comes to moral messages. It's a mixed right. bag. But what about Shakespeare? You, are you preserving? It's a language. It's a drama. It's the beauty. It's the intelligence. So, what is it about? Well, I would say, Britain should become like America, right? The ideas, the ideas of America are true ideas. They are the good ideas for every country. Okay, okay. Uh, it, Britain has a particular spin on them that, that is connected to John Locke and, and to the, the, into, into the, the Enlightenment. So what is Britain? Britain is the Enlightenment. Britain is the idea of reason, individualism, individual rights. Okay. That is what Britain I'm going to challenge that, put my... And of course, it's, 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 yeah, go ahead. Empire. Many people, if you ask what about Britain, yeah, sure. they would say empire. Sure. And f people of my heritage, Pakistan, India, or parts of Africa and other places, yeah. they say that we understand Britain through empire. And that's what made Britain great. Great Britain, this arrogant thing. How could you say you're Great Britain? You've conquered over a third of the world, wherever it is, and then you have the audacity. Well, two things I'd say to that. One is its definition by non-essential. That is not the essential of what made it. The fact that Britain could conquer a third of the world, you have to ask yourself what made it so powerful. The mechanism that in what, place. What, right. what made it so powerful? That's what's interesting, not the fact that it conquered. The fact that it conquered... If you, you know, you could view it as a negative, but, but if you view it as a negative, then you have to ask yourself, you know, is it true that what Britain did in all these colonies mm. was on net, ne uh, negative, or was it on net positive? Mm. Now, I'm not justifying the empire. Yeah. A lot of the stuff done in the empire was horrific, just like in America. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't justify yeah. slavery. Uh, but, you know, is India better off or worse off for, 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 the, for, for Pakistan for, possible? That's for, the question for, if you for, ask about India. For the railroads, for the, for the educational system, the, right. the, 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 the British educational system. But putting that aside, that is not what's essential about Britain. Now, it's true. As, as, as a foreigner looking at Britain, you might say that's how I know it. But then you come here and you study the history and you study the ideas and you have to define Britain not based on what the worst of it is. That's not the essence of a place, right? It would be like saying, well, Germany's Nazis. That's it. Mm. And nobody says that, right? You know, because it's politically incorrect to say, well, Germans are Nazis. That's it. You know, we, we're going to treat, yeah, we're yeah. treat we're, they, they can mm. never overcome that. That's what they are. But they do that for Brits. They and do. they do that to Americans. They do that. Why do they do that? Because we're that good. See, the world hates virtue. The world hates goodness. The world hates capitalism. And it hates individualism. And the two countries that have symbolized that more than any other countries in human history, Great Britain and the United States. Would you States, say they hate capitalism more than Nazism? They hate Nazism, but they don't hate the Germans because the Germans are not capitalists. They're not individualists. You see, they don't hate the fundamental ideas of Nazism just like they don't hate the fundamentalization of the years of communism. They hate the manifestation of Nazism, but not the idea. So what is the idea of Nazism? It's collectivism. Everybody's a collectivist. Everybody's a collectivist today. Uh, it's nationalism. Nationalism today is very popular. It's Superiority. racism. Superiority. It's, it's yeah. racism. Who's not a racist today? Many people are. The left is a racist, yeah. right? The left has identity politics. It's full of racism. Well, the majority of countries outside of Europe are. And, and the, and the, and, but even in Europe, mm -hmm. the left is racist. And, yeah. and the right is becoming more and more racist. Yeah, yeah. So if you actually break down what Nazism is, they don't disagree with it. 
And, yeah, and, and suddenly, if you break down what communism is, they don't understand. What is communism about? Collectivism, they love collectivism. Living for your neighbor, everybody thinks that's moral and that's your duty is to live for your neighbor. Sacrifice, yeah, I mean, what did Lenin says? You yeah. have to break a few eggs to, 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 to make an omelet, right? So everybody believes that you have to break a few eggs to make an omelet, so that's fine. So if you sacrifice okay. a few individuals for the collective, why so is that? Yeah. And that's why they still love communism. They don't have that the same negative association. And they still love the fundamental ideas behind Nazism. And that's why these things can repeat themselves and they can keep coming back and why we have to be so vigilant and why the only alternative to them is individualism and capitalism. And as long as we don't fight okay. for individualism, this is why I, I, was, I reject conservatism, because they're collectivists. They're just moderate collectivists as compared to the board of radical So just on the last point, then I want to move on to something else. This is good and let me just say, I don't want to conserve anything, so I'm not a conservative. So no, I don't want to conserve. I don't conserve. I want to conserve the good, and I want to chuck the the, the bad. But that's still and conserving so, so, something, so, so, right? Well, no, because the, 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 if it's British, it's good, right? I, you know, from their perspective, right? I, I want to take British history and say this is good. Okay, we'll keep that Shakespeare. This is bad. The monarchy. We'll kick that out, right? I mean, what conservative would say, let's kick out the monarchy, that's true, right? That's true. So I want to, you know, National Health Service, awful, let's kick it out, mm. uh, which no conservative would say. No. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Oxford University, good, but let's make sure the government doesn't intervene too much, so it's really a private institution, which is less and less of the yeah, time, yeah, yeah. right? Let's figure out, John Locke, good. Um, uh, Mill, half good, half bad. Right. right. So, and, it's and, a, so you yeah. Yeah. I, case I want by to case. discriminate. Yeah. Case what is case. good and what is bad. Okay. And let's keep all the good, and that's British. Right. That's so, what England represents. But again, this is the last point because yeah. I've got so much to cover. I know, I know. This, is, this is a very interesting conversation. So much to cover. But on deciding what is good and bad, that again is subjective. Someone could say disagree with you and say, no, actually, I think Mill is better than Locke, or I think absolutely not. There's only one standard for deciding what is good and what is bad. Is it pro-human life or is it anti-human life? And, and at the end but of the again, day... again, like I said, if you've got to crack a few eggs... Again, it's wrong, but if you've got to crack a few eggs... hundred million people died. That's anti-human life. If a million people die, that's anti-human life. So you could argue that the British occupation of India because it resulted in, I don't know, famines or whatever was anti-human life. Fine, then it's bad and we kick it out. But the standard is, mm. and we judge the history and we evaluate, is it good for human life? Now, we can look at Shakespeare and say, is Shakespeare good for human life? And I would say, and this is waste... You could conceivably see people argue because art is difficult, but no, Shakespeare is actually on the, on the balance, yes, massive yeah. enhancing yeah. human life and you know, the, the joy that you get from watching a Shakespeare play overrules any mm. other considerations and it's pro-human life, so yes, absolutely yes. Uh, you know, is, uh, is, uh, is uh, Kandinsky pro-human life? No, it's mm. garbage. It's splashing paint on a canvas is not art and contributes nothing to human life. Now, there, I, you know, defining objective standards for art is more difficult. Mm. But on most political issues, this is simple. Are people thriving? Are people getting rich? Are people enjoying their lives? Right. Or are they dying of starvation or are they suffering in, in concentration right. camps? So it's very easy in my okay. view to look at history and say this is pro and this is against. Okay, um, now next question is open borders, immigration is communism. Uh, Mr. Brook is an enemy of capitalism slash the free market. That's a question. Whoever says that doesn't know what communism is. They have no conception of, cap of communism, and they certainly have no conception of what c capitalism is. So can you explain to me, and this is, again, coming back to the, the free market versus the conservative you know, way of thinking, they are for borders, limited immigration. You're saying no borders, no uh, No, I, I'm a strong believer in borders. And I'm a strong believer in, in a nation state. I don't think, I think there are probably too many nation states, so there probably sure. should be a lot fewer of them. But I'm a strong believer in a nation state because you, you, need, you need a body of law. But then at the same time, particular you're pro immigration. I'm very pro immigration. Very pro immigration. Very pro immigration. So uh, how do you delineate that, or how do you differentiate that from the conservative? Why are you pro and they are anti? Well, they're anti because, for many reasons. One, because there's a, there's a xenophobic streak in many conservatives that associate the nation not with an idea not with the good parts of history, but with color of skin or heritage or genes culture or bloodline. Well. Oh, but culture, if you have a good culture, you, anybody will assimilate into that culture. That's not I, always true. I mean, many people in this country haven't assimilated. Well, that's because you don't try to assimilate them and you keep telling them their culture, your culture is not good enough to, to, to assimilate into. The fact is that if, if Britain was proud of its own culture, and could define its culture. I mean, you Ursula said, we can't even define the culture, yeah. but if we defined it properly, mm. and we had clear vision of what it actually was, then people would assimilate. Take the United States. The United States assimilation is happening all the time. 
within two to three generations, people are completely assimilated into the culture. That was true of Italians and Irish and Jews of the 19th century, and it's uh, and it's true of Mexicans and Hondurans it's actually, it's, and, and Chinese yeah. today. You know, the, you most, the, the people from my background, Pakistanis or Indians that go to America, are very different to the Pakistani Indians that come to. That's the because America has a defined culture; it understands what it is, or it used to. I think that's fading. It used to understand very clearly. See, a country that's free. And a country that knows what it is, is confident. It's not afraid of it's new certain. people. Right. It's not afraid of new people coming in and, 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 and being convinced that they are good. So America is a melting pot where you bring your values in and, yeah. you, in and you keep the good ones and you trash the bad ones. And the problem in England today, and the problem in America today, and the rest of the world, is we, we, dare, we dare not say that there are bad values. Right? Because of multiculturalism, all values are equal. Mm. I say if you want to come here uh, as a Muslim, fine. But you realize that if you're going to treat the women, you, first of all, you, you can't, you can't uh, you, you know, mutilate the genitals. That's against the law and you'll go to jail and you go to jail and we'll throw away the key. Right? Mm. This is not, we're not going to be nice to you. And you can't, if you, if you beat your women, you know, that, will not be, that will not be tolerated. You will go to jail. And if you treat your women badly, you know, we might not be able to put you in jail for that, but we will ostracize you. We will tell call you, you that that is, we will call you out. We will tell you that that is mm. unacceptable behavior because that is not a way a civilized people behave. So what is lacking in the West is this spine. recognition. It's, it's fine. It's, fine right. it's a recognition that we have values. Our values are superior to those other values. That's why they're coming here, not we're going there. And that we need to assert those values, not by using force, but just by speaking up, by asserting them, by, by, by living by example and by telling people, you want to live here? Fine, but, Fine, but this is, so, so people assimilate when, when you have a clear set of values that you know yeah. what they are and you, and you fight for those values. You can values. only assimilate into something if you've defined it clearly, otherwise what am I assimilating yes. into? And the reason America right. is a place where people assimilate more to, and certainly historically have assimilated easily, it's because it's much clearer, it's much more well-defined, and okay. the expectations are obvious. So let me ask. So, so to me, you know, this cultural threat is not a threat. I, I believe, for example, in American culture, people come, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll assimilate them, they'll okay. become Americans. So um, this is a threat or rather a concern that I've seen more on the right, conservatives, whatever you want to call it. If, for example, in 2070 or 2000, let's say, eight years time nearly, the vast majority of Americans were of Mexican descent. Yeah, eighty percent. I'm just making up a number, whatever it is. I don't care. Would you? Mean. You wouldn't care. Well, no. I, what I would ask you is, you know, what's what's the country like? That is, is, is it still a free country? Mm. Is is are the institutions still are the institutions okay, still so the same institutions? What if the language of government was Spanish? I think that would be a mistake. Why? Well, because I think that the to, to fully understand the founding documents of America, they were written in English. English is part of the country. It's very easy to translate. Languages are not equivalent. But the, the point is mm. that, that if now the language is Spanish, then America's failed in assimilation. And that's a bad sign, right? So to me, it's not about the color of people's skin. It's not about where they come from. It's not about the culture they used to have. What culture do they have today? And if they've adopted English, and they, and they love Thomas Jefferson and, and George Washington, and, they've, and they love the Constitution mm. and Declaration of Independence, and they love a system of divided government, you know, of, yeah, of yeah. government, of, of the division of, 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 um, of authority within yeah, the government, yeah. that, you know, if they love the system of government in America, and they love freedom, and, and they want to be left what alone, if, and they want to leave other people alone. if all of that was true, yeah. and these guys were libertarians as hell, or yeah. free market as yeah. hell. I don't care what but, color skin they but have. But they spoke Spanish. I, look, Dan, if all of that were true, then I wouldn't care. <laughs> but, but, if all, but, but that yeah. is so impossible to actually, that wouldn't happen. And, and indeed, you know, I don't care where you're free, right? So if you could establish an America in Mexico, if you could establish an America in Brazil, if establish the, the China Congo, or whatever, yeah. in the Congo, yeah. I don't care. I don't right. care who are the people. What I care about is, is individual human freedom, right. about the values. And I don't care who adopts those values. I want everybody mm. to adopt those values. But if some people adopt it first, I don't care where they come from. I, 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 you know, that's again the tribalism, the collectivism, the, 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 the ultimately the, the racism yeah. that, that infuses our culture. And, and I think it's, it's barbaric. And I think we live in a 21st century. It's time to end it. It's time to get over it. La last point on this. Many conservatives have said the way libertarians or free, free, free market people would think is unrealistic. They are talking about this in theory. Yes, I don't care about color skin and this kind of stuff. But in practice, when these people come from different countries and they, these countries are less developed and 
more tribalistic and they are not afraid of asserting their values, right? Even if, the, if those yeah. values are equal yeah. or so. Now, if we libertarians or free market guys, oh, welcome, come into our country, whatever it is, and these guys, the way they treat their women or themselves or other people, and then there's a racial element to it sure. and there's a linguistic sure. element to it, sure. and now certain streets sure. or towns or cities have changed sure. radically, sure. visibly. Sure. And sure. now the host or the native population yeah. is feels under threat. Yeah. So I'd say the conservatives need to, need to uh, focus their energies on what matters and, and f focus their energies on what is it that makes Britain Britain? What is it that makes it great? What, you know, focus their energies on defining the culture, in asserting themselves, in, in, in changing the dialogue and not letting the left, you know, uh, mm. not accepting multiculturalism and fighting against it. The battle is not they shouldn't be expending all this energy on building walls. Instead, they should be expending the energy on defining a culture that they want to live under right. and, and, and <clears throat> denouncing from the top of the ivory tower and from every other tower in the land, okay. denouncing multiculturalism. But look, it's, it's, it's more than that. You know, the state has only one role in my view. And that is the protection of individual rights. You can't protect individual rights of some by violating the rights of others. Right. You can't protect rights if you're violating rights. So by putting up borders, by, by putting up walls, by putting up restraints against innocent people, and we can define what innocent means, right? And, and I don't think everybody should be allowed in. You, you have to have some criteria. But by creating, by violating other people's rights, you're not protecting Britons. You, 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 at the end of the day, you're creating a government that now has more power than it had before. You're not going to be able to limit that power. Well, and, and that's what know. we've seen. We've seen governments <laughs> that are more statist, more involved, not just in the border, but in our health care, in our economy, in every, in, aspect, our, yeah. in every aspect of yeah. our lives. So, so I want to shrink government back to the point where, where it, it, you know, it is, it, you know, and every government, I, I strongly believe that every government should be unique and have its own geographic area. I'm not an anarchist. Um, every one of those governments should, have a, should, should be focused on protecting the individual rights and it should not be violating people's rights. Okay. People have a right to cross the border. I have a right, you have a right, to invite your family from Pakistan to visit you here or to come and work for you. Mm. You have a business, you hire them. What is it my business, who you hire? What is it my business, who spends time in your home? What is it my business? Unless they are a threat to me, it's none of my business. Now, this is where the state needs to intervene. The only place for the state to intervene it's when it comes to immigration yeah. is to try to figure out if there's a threat. Now, I am somewhat sympathetic to Muslim immigration bans because to the extent that we say we can't differentiate between the Islamists, the people who want to kill us, and, and, and the, more, average, yeah. Yeah, the average yeah. Muslim who, 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 who could assimilate, uh, to the extent that I can't differentiate, okay, so no Muslims, okay, fine. Um, but Poles, um, you know, non-Muslim Africans, you know, they're not a physical threat to us. They're th and if we're confident, they, they will assimilate, okay. they do assimilate. If you look around the culture, they have assimilated. And, you know, you look pretty assimilated to me. Thank you very much. In spite I of the fact that, that you yeah. come from a, what, yeah. a Muslim background, you yeah. come from a, from, from, from a family. And yet, here you are, what, second generation? You oh, weren't even born here. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you, you, you were born in Pakistan. So, so I mean, you're an example. That, that you. it's, it's, it's just not true yeah. that people don't assimilate. Okay. They do assimilate. And so, so you, want, you want to separate a threat. So you want to be able to, at the border, you want to be able to, 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 to eliminate uh, anybody with an infectious disease, obviously. Anybody who has a criminal background, uh, you know, particularly given that or, or is engaged in criminal activity that you have would information you let communists on. Would you let come in? What's that? Would you let communists yes. come in? Yes, I wouldn't judge people's ideas. Um, and really? But I thought that was the whole thing. If someone's like a I would judge their ideas, but it's not the government's job to judge ideas. Now, if we're at war with communism, so during the, during the Cold War, let's say, then no, right? Because we're at war. That's why I would exclude Islamists. Right now, I believe the West is at war with certain elements within the Muslim world. So you don't let, you know, during World War II, you didn't let Nazis in. I, so if there's a war, you exclude the people who are on the other side. Right. But gotcha. there's no war with communism. Communism is a pathetic ideology that's dying. And, and you know, I, I'm not afraid of it. Okay. It's, not, it's not something you need to keep out because you're afraid of. Okay. Communism. You mentioned communism. Why are so many atheists, secular people, why do they tend to be more on the left economically? Socialist, communist, they have a 
a soft spot for this ideology. Why? If we can say God does not exist and we do not have to derive our morality from God, why do we then turn and say, well, now we need to derive our morality, um, morality from government? And now government has become the God. No, I don't think that's the problem. I think the issue is that uh, most secularists, and you can see this in the new atheists, do not challenge moral, do not challenge the religious morality. They've accepted religious morality. They just take away God. But they've accepted the idea that is at the heart of Christianity, that the purpose of your life is to serve other people. I saw you made a connection between communism and Christianity, and that Jesus yes. was some sort of communist or something. Yeah, like that. yeah well, Christ Christianity. I mean, I know a lot of uh, Republicans or conservatives will be jumping out of their seats. How could no. you say no. Jesus is a communist? That's crazy. Well, first, of course, he is. I mean, if you're not a communist, but he's, he's definitely on the socialist side spectrum, of it. I mean, yeah. on the spectrum, just read, read some of the amount. I mean, you can see it. But that, that's the point is this morality trumps politics. And the moral code that everybody out there accepts is a moral code of sacrifice. Your life is not important. What's important is what you do for other people. And this is Christian. This is a Christian morality. This comes from Christianity. This is why we adore Mother Teresa and hate Bill Gates, even though Bill Gates has helped more poor people than Mother Teresa I could even imagine. Not even a competition. Right? Not even, yeah. But we love, we, we adore Mother Teresa in the culture. Why? Because she sacrificed, because she suffered, because she gave, because she didn't do anything for herself. Mm. Self-interest is the devil. It's the evil, according to, you know, at the end of the day, according to Christianity. What Marx did is secularize Christianity. What Marx did is saying, you're right. Your life is meaningless. You should sacrifice to that group, but it's, it's not God you should sacrifice. You should sacrifice purely to your fellow man. And your fellow man is equal to you. And every, so what, so what the Christianity yeah, yeah. does is it changes God to the proletarian. Instead of, inst and, and it even has, yeah. and it, Marxism, and yeah. even, even, even um, they even have their own pope, right? So, so uh, in Christianity, you as an individual don't know the truth. You have to go through a pope in yeah, order yeah. to reveal truth, right? Well, in, 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 co in communism, it's exactly the same. You, as a member of the proletarian, don't know what's good for the proletarian, so you need a dictator, right? And the, and the dictator is the pope. He's the one who communes with the spirit of the Amazing. proletarian Amazing. and then communicates to you what's good for the proletarian. Your life doesn't matter. What matters is the proletarian. And you need to do whatever it takes to make the proletarian better off, including die, if that's, if that's yeah. what it means, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and this is the point of all moral systems that exist today except objectivism, really. Right. Your life doesn't matter as an individual. What matters is the life of the group okay. of God. And, and therefore, communism is palatable. What's wrong with communism? You, you, you're just living for the sake of other people. You're sacrificing for the sake of other people. Didn't my mother teach us that you have to think of other people first and never think of yourself and don't be too selfish and don't be too self-interested? Of course, we've all grown up with socialism in our mother's milk. We can't challenge it. And that's what Ayn Rand does. She challenges Amazing. it for the first time. Okay. I find your views on foreign policy and war probably the most controversial. And they're, just, they're just direct consequences so, of my views on everything else. So could I quote you? I think this is a, 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 a near about quote. You can tell me if I'm wrong. Um, where's it gone? I heard I've lost the quote. But you were saying that um, when you were fighting in a war, this whole just war theory, you are completely against that. Absolutely. And you say that if we need to, again, correct me if I'm wrong, if we need to kill innocent civilians in the process, then so be it. We yep. should not limit our military uh, action because some innocent civilians die. We need to crush our enemy at all costs. Yes. Come what may. Yeah, assuming the wars are worth self-defense, assuming you were attacked first. So let's say Mexico attacked the United States. Hmm. Then anybody who dies in the war between Mexico and the United States is, is, is the responsibility of the Mexican government. They initiate it first. If a criminal, if a criminal comes and he, and, he, and he shoots you, and, I, you know, and I'm shooting back and by accident I kill a bunch of innocent bystanders, is it my fault or is it his fault? Hmm. It's clearly morally his responsibility for initiating force. And the same thing is true of a government. If a government initiates force against right. me, then the only responsibility, let's say the American government, the only responsibility of the American government in defending itself is to defend itself. And what does it mean to defend itself? To defend the lives and property of Americans. It has no concerns with the life and property of Mexicans. That is the concern of the Mexican government. Right. Now, it should accept, you know, this goes to immigration, it accept anybody who wants to come into America and avoid the war. But those who stay are now at war with you, are trying to kill you, are trying to destroy you, 
and you have to do whatever's necessary not to defeat them. It would be complete altruism, a complete negation of self-interest to okay. say, so I'm not going to harm those people because they're women or children or whatever, but I'm going to sacrifice 10 of my troops in order not to harm them. Why? My only job as a government is to protect okay. my troops. So l let me uh, counter that with an example. So let's say me and you get into a boxing match, yeah. right? We both got gloves on, and then out of nowhere, you kick me. Yep. Now that's not in the rules yeah. of boxing. Yeah. So I'm saying the same way there's a war. Yes, you have to defend yourself yeah. throughout war, but there are certain rules even within the war that a military should not you know, break. That to me is insanity. So, uh, I on. mean, war is about, what is war? What is about destruction and killing? What rules? What are you There's talking no about? There's no rules. There's no absolute so zero rules. Nuclear, chemical, kids, children, Look, bombing a church, I'm for not example. Advocating for killing children. <laughs> but, but absolutely, you do. I mean, there's only one principle in war win quickly with minimal casualties to your own side. I mean, I consider Hiroshima and Nagasaki two new, uh, dropping mm. the nuclear bombs heroic acts of Truman. They saved hundreds of thousands of American lives, probably saved millions of Japanese lives. But Truman. How so? Well, because it prevented an invasion of Japan, right? Japan collapsed and, and surrendered and it was all over. I, I mean, so, what, so ideally one swift blow and game over Absolutely. as opposed to a prolonged... Absolutely. If, if, you know, and, and I would bet you that most of the wars that exist today from, from the, the prolonged wars like Vietnam or even the Iraq and Afghanistan Iraq, war, Afghanistan, if, if they had gone in and crushed the enemy and made a statement we will crush you. We will do whatever's necessary to pacify you. We will not. Now, I'm not advocating for those wars. I think they were mistaken wars. Hmm. But if you go to war, then that's what you should do. You have to win, and you have to win quickly. Look how many hundreds of thousands of Iraqis have died. Well, um, I think over a million, actually. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Of Iraqis have died yeah. because of this prolonged. Imagine if on day one they killed them. I mean, I'm not advocating for this, just to be clear. Mm -hmm. Imagine if the day one they would have killed a million Iraqis. Right. The war would have ended. Iraqis would not want to wanted to fight. Nobody would want to touch the Americans. They would be petrified, and it would be over. But you would, everybody would say that is the most horrific act in all of human history. Yeah. Well, a million have died. More than a million. Well, no, and then it's over over a long period of time. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. But if it had been in one day, everybody would have cared, as if time matters. But surely that's the uh, magnitude. <laughs> I mean, the, the the magnitude of the attack. And the sort of indiscriminate I nature. don't believe you need to kill a million people. I'm not no, advocating I, I know, for that I know, or anything. Well, let's say I'm just saying, or like 20, I'm just saying if you had done something, but, but they die anyway, and war die as a consequence. So if you care about human life, you want to get it over with quickly okay. and get it over so, with. So, so, so many people... Now again, assuming the war is a war of self-defense, yeah, assuming, yeah, assuming all those what, things, what yeah, you're yeah. doing is a just war, just war in the sense that you're acting, you're acting in the cause of justice. So Not in executing the war, but in the cause yeah, of sure. So many people who watch my channel are from a Middle Eastern background, Muslim background, and they may have sympathy with sort of like objectivism, skepticism, yep. atheism, all the rest of it. But if I want to sell them the American dream, they're like, well, what America has done in the Middle East to turn it upside down and intervention there, oil here, oil there. Oh, come on. Funding one group against another. Sure, I'm not going to defend America. I mean, so, I'm not going to defend America's policy in the Middle East, but the Middle East was messed up and screwed oh, up and I would disaster say it's not, well before has America it showed up. No, I, I, I completely agree. But has it helped? Yeah, I think, it's, I, th I think life in certain countries in the Middle East is better because of American intervention. Right. But overall, no, America's done a disaster job. Why has it done a disaster job? Because it appeases everybody. It it, 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 it it doesn't assert itself. It doesn't assert its values. I think Why it's is America itself many it? times? Never. Invasions are... Uh, never. Never. Never asserted itself. I'll give you an example. Okay. okay, so you go into Iraq. Yep. You can't... You take Iraq. And now, what would it mean to assert yourself in Iraq? What it means to assert itself is like what well, we asserted ourselves in Japan. You know who wrote the Japanese constitution that they still live by? Who? General MacArthur. Right. He literally sat down, his, the Japanese wrote a constitution, he looked at it and he said, this is crap, and he shredded it. Right. He sat down at his desk with his assistant, this is a true story, mm. and he wrote a constitution. And he said, this is what you're going to live by. This mm. is your constitution. What did the Americans do in Iraq? They brought a committee of tribal leaders, who, you know, uh, you know and, and, and religious leaders, and, and, and all kind of, and they wrote a constitution. It's just an unmitigated disaster. What you'd expect mm. that a group of tribalists would write as a constitution. So what do you get? You get a mess in Iraq. You get a complete disaster. Playing devil's advocate, is their country, surely they have a right to decide what their 
Constitution says. Nobody right? has a right to enslave your own people. You don't have a right to violate other people's rights. I don't care if it's your own country or not. You, you know, you, you, would you say, oh, Americans had a right to slavery. It was their own country. Mm -hmm. So they enslaved some people. Who cares? No. And, and now, that is true of slavery, but it's also true of, 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 uh, of laws, let's say, that discriminate against Shiites or discriminate against Sunnis or discriminate against Terms women or rubble. discriminate against uh, atheists. Is it okay to discriminate against atheists or discriminate against Christians? Or no, none of those things are right. And even if you vote for them, they're not right. Even if the entire country thinks they're right, they're not right. This is why there is such a thing as objective truth. You want a successful country? There's a formula. It's called the Declaration of Independence of the United States of America. It's called the American Constitution. These are formulas. They're not perfect. You could rewrite them, but that's the formula. That's a general formula. If Iraq wants to be a successful country, you got to adopt the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution in spirit, if not in, 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 in exactness. And that is true of every Middle Eastern country. To the extent that they don't do that, they will be disasters. And even if people like the disaster, they don't have a right to have mm. the disaster. They don't have a right to discriminate against the individuals who reject it. What about the atheists in Iraq who, who, who don't want this constitution because it's all about religion, it's all about Sharia? Hmm. Okay, fair enough, that's, inter that's interesting. But that I'm saying is very hard. Groups don't have rights. Individuals. Only individuals yes, have yes, rights. I agree with you. And the only purpose of government is to protect those rights and to the extent that America goes into a country, the only purpose of going into that country should be, should be, to bring them freedom. So do you think and, and by, by letting the Iraqis write their own yeah. constitution, they didn't allow them to establish freedom. So it was a complete failure and complete disaster. So would you withdraw like troops from Saudi Arabia and other parts in the Middle East? Today? Or whenever? What, what, what difference does that make? I mean, you said time doesn't make a difference, right? So, so I, would do, I, would do, I would do two things. So, you know, so this is where a lot of people hate my guts. Um, I believe we're at war. You know, have been a war um, with with Islamism, um, jihadism, whatever you want to call it, since 1979, uh, exactly 30 years ago. 30 years or 40 years ago? Yeah, I can't do math anymore. 40 years ago, yeah. um, when uh, when uh, the, embassy, the American embassy was taken, which is an act of war, and uh, when I think the Islamist movement, in its current form, was really launched. I mean, it. it there's a Muslim Brotherhood that goes even further to the 1920s, mm. and there's Wahhabism that goes back to the 18th century. But in its modern form, <coughs> the Islamist movement was really formed in, in 1979. Even the, even the Sunnis um, uh, mm. were inspired by the Iranian Revolution. Yes, they were. Now, to me, Iran is the key country. Iran and Saudi Arabia are the two countries that fund all the terrorism, whether they do it as government policy or whether they do it through charities or whether they do it through other ways. They're the countries that do it. So, in my view, America has to take care of business uh, first, and then withdraw from the Middle East. I, I, not mm -hmm. just from the Middle East, by the way. The, the, the American troops in 120 oh, yes, different yes, countries. Yes, yes, yes. I would withdraw them from South Korea. Let, if South Korea is a co rich country, they can defend themselves. Mm -hmm. I would withdraw them from Japan. Let Japan defend itself. I would withdraw them from everywhere. Germany as well. Certainly, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, who are they defending against? The Russians? Let the Germans fight the Russians. Americans shouldn't have to fight the Russians. So. I, I would withdraw American troops from all these countries, but before I do that, this is where, you know, so libertarians all agree which war the, which yeah. war. But I believe before that you have to take care of business. Take care of business means two regime changes, in Saudi Arabia and in Iran. Now, in Iran it's more difficult because the regime there is more entrenched, so you might have to use military force but to do it. they have a nuclear weapon that they're developing as well. So if well another a, reason to, yeah. to change the regime there and to make clear that, that to that regime, the new regime that comes about, that they better behave themselves, otherwise, you know, but this they is will the, come back. But this is the sort of American policeman, and this is true. No, it's not policeman. If you, do, if, you to, if, 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 um, if these countries attack each other, if Iran fights with Iraq, America should stay out of it. If, uh, if Pakistan and India want to get at it, America should stay out of it. Even if it's a nuclear and it could affect... Well, if it affects American citizens, American American property, if it has, then America should get involved. Okay. But, is, but the role of America is not to be the policeman of the world. Right. See, you want them to be a policeman of the world when it's convenient for you. No, and, you don't, <laughs> and you don't want them to be policemen of the world when it's not convenient for you. That's what conservatives and everybody else right. wants. Okay. I don't want them to be policemen of the world, except in one sense. Mm. They need to protect. So the United States should have this, the, the fleets in the Arabian Sea and all around that region to protect the, 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 the shipping lanes so that they can get the oil. And that they can, they can, you know, trade international trade should continue. That is a crucial role for the American military to practice, and it's it's a part of the individual rights of Americans to be able to trade yeah. with whoever they want. 
they need to re replace the regime in Iran and they need to replace the regime in Saudi Arabia. The fact that we are allies of a king is disgusting and despicable. We shouldn't have an embassy in Saudi Arabia. We should have nothing to do with the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And Would you wipe them out? You wouldn't wipe them out. I don't think you need to wipe them out. You see, everybody thinks that this requires wiping people out. All you have to do to the Saudis is go boo. I mean, what do the Saudis have? Right. Nothing. They're a poor country. Yeah. They have nothing. They have oil. So all you have to do is say, we're not going to protect you anymore. And the Saudis would shudder, right. right? So all you have to do there is challenge them right. and let them know that you will not tolerate. You know, when the Saudis and the Iranians and the rest of the, uh, stole the oil, they stole it from Western oil companies. But it's in their country, right? I mean, it's, it's their, it's their there oil. is no such thing as their country in that sense. But the same way when you attack America, we're attacking Amer like the country of America. America is specific people with specific property rights. So why isn't Saudi the whose same? Property rights were, 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 whose property rights were violated by all companies in Saudi Arabia? G give me the name of the person. Well, I don't know their names. But yeah. yeah, it was the king. Okay. Kings don't have property rights. Kings do not have property rights. Kings are an abomination. There is no, the king doesn't have property rights. So if, if there's a land in Saudi Arabia that nobody owns, and I discover oil on that, who's oil? In Texas. If you discover oil in Texas on your land, whose oil is it? America's? It's your oil. Right. It's, not, it's not America's I'm oil. I'm going to Texas. Okay. What's that? No, no I'm, I'm going to go Texas. But, but in any way, if, if I discover oil in my property in California, in Puerto Rico now, I live in Puerto Rico, if I discover oil in my property, it's my oil. If, 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 if you have a property in Saudi Arabia and you discover oil, it's not the king's, it's not the Saudi state's oil. That's mm. communism for the guy who mm. accused me of communism. No. <laughs> Capitalism is about private property. If I want to invite people onto my private property, this goes back to immigration. It's my business, it's not the state's business who I invite to my property. And if I discover oil in my property, it's my property, it's none of the state's business what I do with that. That is private property, that's what capitalism means. So there is no such thing as American oil. There's no such thing as American jobs. There's no such thing as American anything. There's individual Americans own things. That's the job of the American state is to protect those property rights. It's to protect my right to bring in as many Mexicans as I want to live on my land as I want. It's to protect my right to the oil that I have in the land so nobody can steal it and thieve it. It's not their oil, it's my oil. And the gotcha. state has to. So the same thing in, in Saudi Arabia. When American oil companies discovered oil in Saudi Arabia, and it was their oil, and then the Saudis stole it from them, Saudi king stole it from them, that's when America should have, inter it should have intervened and said, no, you can't steal our people's stuff. Very interesting, very interesting. Speaking of oil and land, the environment. Okay, this has been something which has been going around for some time now. Greta Thunberg, the environment's going to die. And okay, okay, this is where I do, I am concerned, okay, because I'm a big fan of wildlife. I, I, I want this uh, earth to prosper. You know, we talk about self interest. Why do you want the earth to prosper exactly? So, the, the air we breathe, the water that we drink. I so, think. you want human beings to prosper? Yeah, and that is... Or do, you want, or do you want the earth to prosper? You have to decide. Human beings, the, our existence is intrinsically tied. Maybe. But who do, you, who do you care about? Do you care about the earth, the earth, or do you care about human beings? Well, both. Well, no, I want you to choose. See, I only care about one. I don't care about the earth. I care about human beings. And to the extent that okay. human beings need the so earth, then I care about the earth. Okay, so but yes. the primary is human beings. Primary is human beings. We that. have to take Great. care of our okay. own interests. So let's, we yeah. start with that. The primary is human beings. Mm. Right. So, so then we get on to pollution, whether it's in the water, whether it's in the air. How, if we're going to advocate for a free market society, how on earth are we going to protect the environment to the extent that our lives are benefited? So you have to start with facts, right? Okay. The fact is. Global warming, do you believe in the global warming, climate change? Put aside global warming a second. Okay. The fact is that the human environment today is the best it's ever been in all of human history. That's amazing. You literally breathe the cleanest air you've ever breathed. It's cleaner than in the little village in Pakistan where they were burning wood and where the cooking stove inside the house was polluting the air that be because of the fact that we're burning carbon fuels and we have electricity and we have all these things that make it possible for us to breathe unbelievably good air inside our homes. I have a little thing in my home that actually gives me the quality of the air in my home and it's pretty cool, mm. it's pretty amazing, right? You drink the, 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 the cleanest water we've ever drunk in all of human history. The water right was now. so bad that they, had beer, they, they were drinking beer because the water was so exactly. bad. Exactly, yeah. and, and the Thames River used to smell so badly. It used to stink, right? But Northern Europeans drink beer because the water was so bad. It, Chinese 
Why did they drink tea? Why did they invent tea? It forced them to boil the water. Amazing. To kill the bacteria. Amazing. So we, it's, we live longer, healthier, easier lives as human beings than ever in all of human history. Fewer people die today of weather events, than ever. weather, than ever in human history because of industrialization. All of this, the, the cleanliness we experience today is all a consequence of, 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 of industrialization. We have, um, what do you call it, uh, uh, Hoover's, um, you know, they clean our carpets. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. But vacuum, yeah. Vacuum cleaners. Yeah. We have robots who do it. Yeah. I don't know if you've seen the robots. Yeah, I've seen the, yeah, You yeah. don't even have to pull them. Right. It's cool, right. right? You can clean. You, we have amazing technology. It's air conditioning, air filters. You can have filtering but systems. That's within, like, for example, your <laughs> office, your house, whatever. Outside, go outside. It was amazing. Well, let's As go, compared to London in the 19th century, we had okay. so, so let's all go, over the so place. So let's go to India or like China or Bangladesh. Yes, Those poverty stinks. Quite literally. Poverty stinks in every aspect of it. And how do you become rich? By burning, the, by, by using the cheapest, most efficient form of energy, which today is carbon fuels. Maybe one day will be nuclear, but today is carbon fuels. In order to get rich so you can clean up the mess. The only way to clean our environment, the only way to clean human environment, if you care about little worms, if you care about spotted owls, I can't help you. But if you care about human okay. beings, the only way to clean up human environment is to get rich. Rich countries are clean, not because the environmentalist movement, but because rich people want a clean environment. So they do things that make it clean, so including passing laws prohibiting polluting of those compounds that actually hurt our health. Oh, so, okay, so this is interesting you, that you mentioned that because the free market would say to the companies, you can basically, there's, there's no regulation, of course, the protection of, of property rights and so forth. But when it comes to pollute, like if, if, if a company is releasing all these gases. Yeah. So if the gases are clearly hurtful to your life that, and you can show it in a court of law, then you would sue the company. that costs a lot of money and that takes a long time. In the process, they could still be guzzling these gases and... Okay, but life expectancy is still like what you for your generation, well into your 80s, maybe mm. into your 90s. Well, you know, so, you know, you're losing one year. But, but the fact that this industrialization has made it possible for you to live in your 80s, remember, just 150 years ago, your life expectancy was under 40. So you're saying this whole global climate thing is number one virtual well, signal. let's wait, and wait for climate. We'll get to climate. Whatever you want to call it, climate change, global warming, because I know no, there's a slight difference. No, look, the two different issues. There's pollution and there's climate change. Uh, climate oh, change is separate. Okay. Pollution is if somebody's spewing out a chemical that hurts me, I sue them, I take it to court, we try it. If I can prove that what they've done is hurtful to me, then they get to pay a big fine. And then the government can pass a law, once it's proved, that says that chemical is bad for human life, we're excluding it. Now take climate change. Now let's make some big assumptions. Go for it. There really is climate change, and it's human cost. Mm. I consider those big assumptions because I'm not convinced uh, that it's human cost. Okay. Climate changes all the time. So the fact that this climate change is undis indisputable, the fact that it's human caused is, I think, still questionable. But let's assume it's true. The primary question everybody has to ask is, so what? So it gets hot, warmer. So, you know what, what, what the primary cost for Britain is? Well, You're going to have to invest in air conditioning mm. because it's going to get hot. No, and well, and, and sure. by the way, you should have air conditioning anyway because it gets hot anyway sometimes in the summer. Yeah, but, uh, and it would be much more convenient for human life if you had air conditioning. So this will be an impetus to improve British life by buying air conditioning. Okay, so th that, I'm serious. Th that's, that's a massive op oversimplification. Tell me what the damage okay, so of Britain getting a little warmer is going to be. I personally don't mind hotter summers, but that's a very... What about warmer winters? Right now it's pretty cold outside. It I'd, is pretty cold. I enjoy warmer. I mean, I like to say Canada would become habitable. I don't, I, mean, I, don't, I, don't I, I don't know if you're joking. I, I, I'm not. I, I, don't know how, I don't understand how people live in Canada today. It's way too cold for true human existence. Okay. Think about all the, think about all the agricultural land that is underneath the ice sheet in Canada that comes, suddenly becomes usable for human. And, and it's true. Some people have to move out of the southwest in the United States because it's too damn hot and they can't live there. And they'll migrate to Canada. Why is that such a terrible thing? So weather has changed throughout human sure. history. So if I were to give you the analogy, so this, so this whole earth is a house, and it's fine, the temperature of the house is slightly more habitable, but there'll be certain parts of the house that are 
have, have been so damaged that they are beyond repair. Yeah, another reason I believe in open immigration, let those people move to the parts of the house that are more habitable. But then surely the house is getting smaller and smaller in terms of the habitable part. Yeah, there's no science behind that. That's complete BS. There's no science that says yeah. that we're going to boil this planet to such an extent that the whole planet is going to become inhabitable. That just is untrue. By the way, and if it is true, then to the extent that that is true, then people are investing a lot of money without government help in trying to solve the problem. You know, the primary problem, if there is a problem, to CO2 emission is nuclear, something the Greens reject, which to me tells you everything you need to do know about this problem. The only solution to the problem, the only viable solution to the problem, is something they reject, which means they don't want to solve the problem. They actually- So, so what's they, the underlying game for them? What's, what's the- Destruction. Of capitalism. Destruction. Of, you, you, of capitalism and human life because that's what it means to destroy capitalism, means to destroy human life. The only reason they eight billion people on the planet right now and they can eat is because of capitalism. So it's With like a side way to attack capitalism, not for the main way. Like absolutely, communism. but it's more than to attack capitalism, it's to attack human life. There are people in the world, it's hard to believe, but there are people in the world who hate for the sake of hatred, who like knocking down stuff, who like destruction, right? Who want to see death and destruction. And if you're such a person, then your primary tool right now is climate change. This is this wow. is a great way to, to, to destroy the capitalist system. And by the way, who are the biggest victims? Africa. Africa is going to be the biggest victim of the anti-climate change because Af that? because Africa could get rich. What would it need to do? What would it need in order to get rich? Cheap energy. But you're taking away the cheap energy. Now you're saying you can't use fossil fuels. That means Africa stays poor because you can. There's no way they can afford solar energy. There's no way they can afford wind energy. And the wind and solar energy... It's like a minimum wage on a... Yeah, it's a, but it's, a, it's yeah. like a minimum, yeah. like setting in a minimum yeah. wage at a thousand bucks an hour. You may be basically keep, keeping a lot of people poor. Okay. And that's what, that's what you're doing to Africa. Now, notice that people like Bill Gates, who believe in climate change, are pouring billions of their own dollars into developing new technologies. If the environmentalists really believed in climate change and really wanted to help human life, they would be supporting efforts by Bill Gates and other people mm. to promote nuclear. Instead, what is, what is, what is, take Germany, right? They're shutting down all their nuclear power plants. They're literally shutting down all their nuclear power plants and building windmills and, 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 and solar panels. Solar panels in, in Germany. I, I've never seen a sunny day in Germany. And then, and then what happens is suddenly the production of electricity has gone like this. They've, it's gone way down. So what do they do? They import natural gas and coal and they reignite old power, power plants and their CO2 emissions are going up because they shut down nuclear power. Now, I can understand a green who comes to me and says, look, I really believe this and I want to invest heavily in nuclear power because that's the only viable solution. I respect somebody like that. And I say, you know, maybe I'm willing to consider what you have to say. But if you're coming to me and saying the only way to solve this problem is to get rid of fossil fuels, you're not serious you don't really care right. you're not pro-human growth and human success in okay. human life one very last quick question on the environment you said the spotted owl tigers lions elephants rhinos these yeah. these animals are suffering because human beings are expanding sure. so sure. i i I'm, I'm a realist in the sense i understand there's a cost sure. of human expansion sure. and human beings living sure. at the same time you like lions i want tigers lions and, and tigers and rhinos sure. and owls sure. to survive so I can't afford it. I, I okay, so get together with a lot of people who like them and buy some. So the, the, so the solution is private property. Like everything mm -hmm. else, the solution is private property. There's an organization in the United States, which I respect their work, right? What they do is they raise money and they go buy forests. They buy forests under the understanding that they will never use those forests. It's a nonprofit that wants to preserve forests the way they are. Fine. Private property. And you know what? Nobody cuts down their trees because it's private property and nobody's allowed to go there. You know what, you that's, that's a good, that's a very good... Uh... Look at Africa. The only place in Africa where, where, where uh, uh, elephants are not endangered species or where elephants are being privatized. Uh, there, there are certain areas in Kenya where the elephant population is being privatized. Uh, you own this property of elephant, and you know how you make a living off the elephants? You sell, you sell um, hunters licenses, and you let the hunters shoot elephants. But you have a strong, self-interested, economic, capitalist, profit-seeking in, in interest not to let the elephants die out. So you only allow X amount of hunting. And you invest in security and protection to keep out poachers. Amazing. 
But that's and, what's got the most outrage in, in and, social media and everything. And yet, that's the only thing reviving the population of elephants in Africa. Every place in Africa that has privatized their wildlife has actually seen an increase in that wildlife. And everywhere where the state is responsible for the wildlife and banning poaching, the poachers get around it because the state won't invest enough resources. But if it's my elephants, then I'm gonna you're not it. shooting them. I'm going to have enough security around that you won't shoot them. If you want to shoot them, you have to pay me. Very and then I'm only going to let you shoot one because I have to preserve the species. So the solution to all these mm. animals going extinct is to privatize them because private property is the only consistent form of prop. It's the only form of property and it's the only thing consistent with human to, life and flourishing. To incentivize the protection and its flourish. Yeah. You know, I am an advocate for private property, not because it incentivizes the protection of elephants. Yeah, I'm, in, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm in charge of private property because it's the only institution that is consistent with human life, that it's the only institution that's consistent with human flourishing and human survival. You, we as human beings need to own the stuff we produce. Okay. And when we do so, look at history, good things happen. Okay. And that is applicable to elephants as well. So and lions and tigers. We'll play a little game here. On a scale of one to ten, mm. one being communist Russia under Stalin, and ten being Ayn Rand's free market society, where do you place Donald Trump? So ten is Ayn Rand, and one is Stalin. Donald Trump is such an enigma. Four. Four. So okay. C closer to communism than Ayn oh, Rand. Oh, interesting. Barack Obama. Four. I don't think I don't think there's that big of a difference. Clinton, Reagan. Reagan maybe five, everybody else for four. So who was the closest to Ayn Rand and who was the f closest to Stalin, American presidents? <sighs> closest to Ayn Rand would be, I don't know, Grover Cleveland, uh, maybe Coolidge, maybe Thomas Jefferson and, and George Washington, the founding fathers, obviously. And closest um, to? Well, I mean, you'd, you'd have to have a long line of, of, of FDR, Johnson, uh, and, and, and Obama and, 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 uh, and Trump, they're the most statist. You say Trump also is in that category? Yeah, he's a complete statist. He calls up CEOs and tells them where they can put their factories and where they can't, who they should fire and who they shouldn't fire. I think I mean, that's he's a complete, Trump, yeah. He's yeah. a complete uh, you know, central planner and he believes in it. So he's deregulated a little bit, he's cut a little bit of taxes, but government spending is like, it's, it's back to Obama levels. So it's back to the first Obama administration, second Obama administration spending actually declined as a percent of GDP. Now we're, we're through the roof percent of GDP. So no, in, in, in many respects, Trump is a, is a complete statist. I mean, the wall, I mean, all of that is, is I mean, who built the wall? The, you know, the, the, the Soviets did to keep their population in. Berlin Wall as well, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's the same thing, right? People have a right to go where they want to go unless they're harming other people, the state, has no role in interfering in human movement unless that movement is a violation of rights. And a Mexican coming to America is not a violation of rights, and an American going to Mexico is not a violation of rights. Okay. Building walls is, a, is, is, is disrupting that movement, and that's wrong. Two last questions from social media. I have a question for Yaron. Does objectivism have a marketing problem? If objectivism is so inspiring, why aren't more people aware of it or inspired by it? And that's by G.S. Singh. I don't think the problem is a marketing problem, although if you have a better marketing solution, I'm, I'm, I'm open to uh, alternative marketing uh, mechanisms. Because when you say words like selfish, yeah. altruism is bad. Yeah. You shut the minds of people. Like They're like, okay, this, is, this must be evil. Young people who want to change the world, they're revolutionary, they want to love and care. If you say altruism is bad, be well, selfish, they're but, like, this is... But this love is and care is not revolutionary. Love and care is like... Everybody, I, I agree. But, but I would say, I would say that if you want to be a revolution, come join the real revolutionaries. We're the only real revolutionaries. I that, that is true. But I, I would say that the left or communism socialism has a better. Now marketing. we don't have a marketing problem. What we have is two thousand years of really, really, really bad philosophy and religion problem. So to overcome Christianity, Judaism, Islam, to overcome Marx, Hegel, Kant, Schopenhauer every philosopher in human, you know, before that, uh, is going to take a long time. And the reason people, you know, if you'd said selfish to a Greek in ancient Greece, they would say, well, of course, what else is there? Because that was the culture. The culture was even Plato, 
who's very dictatorial. Mm. He does it because he believes in individual, having an individual to pursue their self-interest. He, he just says, you know, you can't completely do that for yourself because you, you, you know, you need the philosopher king to guide you. But the purpose is not to sacrifice your life for the collective or for God. The purpose is still to live for your life. Mm. So, so we went through a, a, a dramatic cultural shift with the rise of Christianity, and it's going to take a long time to recover from the damage done by the monotheistic religions, primarily Christianity and Islam. Yeah. Um, Judaism just has never attained enough political power to have a big impact or philosophical power. So it, it's going to take a long time, and it's... You know, I'm not arguing that we couldn't do a better marketing job, but the point, but that's not going to solve the problem. So maybe if I was better at marketing, I'd go from 16,000 subscribers to 100,000 subscribers. But the better marketing is not going to change the world. What needs to change the world is for people to actually be listen, listen, and and, and engage, and, and engage, yeah, yeah. and then, well, of course. Egoism makes sense. I mean, what else is there? Okay. Why should I live for you? So this is a... Uh, anybody other than me. I mean, does anybody really love their neighbor more than themselves or like themselves? Right? What's the Old Testament? The New Testament tells you. Love your neighbor like yourself. I don't love my neighbor like myself. I, I don't really think I love my neighbor. Right? <laughs> I like some of my neighbors. I might... I respect their property rights, but I don't love my neighbors. I and mean, you don't, it, and it, you don't it, need it, to. It, it demeans the value of love. <clears throat> but I love myself. I love my wife. I love my kids. I don't love my neighbors. He's a heartless just, man. Just stop loving your neighbors. <laughs> but you don't. See, see, I'm the only one who actually says it. Everybody thinks they, 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 think they should love yeah. their neighbors. Yeah. And what does that do? See, this is, a, this is the trick that Christianity and socialists understand. Guilt is unbelievably powerful. Yes. Your mother probably understands yeah. this. Jewish mothers certainly understand this. Right? Right? If you guilt people, you, Strong. you can really use them. So if you make everybody believe that they should love their neighbors, but they don't, oh boy. and they feel Shame guilty, them. Then Shame they, them. exactly, yeah, and yeah. then you come to them and say, look, you should really love your neighbors, you should really help them out. We know you don't, but you know what? If I raise your taxes a little bit, we'll take your money and we'll help them we'll for you. With it, yeah. And you go, oh, good. That way I get my, reduce my guilt and I get to not love my neighbors all at the same time. Fantastic. And that's what the state does. The state basically uses guilt in order to expand its power. Guilt alleviating mechanism. Yes, I mean the rich vote for higher taxes all the time. I was gonna, I was, on themselves. I was gonna ask, because I'm not sure about time, very quickly, Bill Gates, Zuckerberg, Warren Buffett, they are for higher taxes. Because they all feel guilty. And, and this is the altruism. This is, they, they, they know they should take care of their fellow man. As much philanthropy as they do, they don't think it's enough. And they don't want to do more philanthropy for a variety of reasons. So, so it's easy for them to say the state should coerce me into more philanthropy. That's what taxes is. And then I'll feel a it's little less guilty. their morality saying, you guys deal with it. That's what everybody does. Gotcha. That's what the church has taught us. That's the whole, the whole idea of, of sin and Catholicism. So you don't help him. Just, okay, last question. Yeah. Last question. We're too, we, I mean, this is the flaw in human beings, according to Christianity and according to conventional morality. Mm. We're all too selfish. And that's the fundamental flaw. That's really the original sin. You know, uh, Eve wanted knowledge. How dare she want knowledge? Because remember, she, she didn't eat from some random apple. The, the apple she ate from was the tree of knowledge. That's what God didn't want her to eat. He didn't want her to have knowledge, right? He wants you to be ignorant. He yes. wants you to be stupid. So she takes a bite from the tree of knowledge. That is the sin. Now, what is that? So, so basically and and that's that's self-interested knowledge is self-interested so basically the original sin is you're self-interested and now you have to spend your life in service of others in or, service of others to idea. overcome that yeah, and yeah. since you can't overcome it since you're going to be selfish anyway then we have to penalize you by taxing you by regulating you by controlling you by by doing all these things to you in order to compensate for that original sin which is how dare you think of yourself amazing last question Please do ask Yaron about comparison between secular humanism and objectivism and why he believes objectivism is the best option for ex-Muslims. Also please ask Yaron if there are any upcoming efforts to translate objectivist literature into languages spoken in Muslim majority countries like Urdu or Arabic. I believe that a lot of ex-Muslims will find their lives enriched by in objectivism. That's by Cher Rose. Yeah. So, um What's the first one? Uh, so, secular humanism. Se secular humanism versus so, objectivism. So secular humanism was a sudden development in uh, the field of ideas um, as the world transitioned away from um, 
the Dark Ages, the Middle Ages, and from, from mm. the dominance of Christianity and, and Christian dogma. Yeah. So uh, secular humanism comes around in the Renaissance as they're discovering Greek ideas, secular ideas, pagan ideas, but really discover, rediscovering philosophy. And they're trying to integrate it, and they're trying to, they're trying to figure out what makes sense, but they, they don't have a solution to the moral question to what is goodness, what is ethics, what right. is right, what is just. <clears throat> so they basically what they do, and this is what I accuse Marx of doing, but really everybody does it, they secularize Christianity. They take the basic premise of Christian morality, the basic commandments, the basic ideas of Christianity, and they turn it into something secular. And so they can only go so far, in my view, with that, because that's a dead end. Because the, 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 and, and the way to crush that is to say, somebody says you should lift other people, is to ask them why. And there's no answer, particularly if you don't believe in God, because the Christian answer is because God said so. Right? By the way, if God says you should kill your oldest child, you should do that. Mm. You know, the only character who is a holy figure for all three religions is Abraham. Abraham. And why? Because of his He's blind also. obedience. Amazing. His blind obedience. He says to God, you know, God comes to me and says, kill your son, I go to, go to hell, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. I at least argue with him, yeah. right? I know he's all powerful, so he'll, uh, he'll do what he wants, but at least I'll argue with Take him, a stand, like yeah. Job does. So. Yeah. But no, Abraham says, yes, sir, and he goes, and it, you know, God stops him in the last minute, because, you know. And then we get the sacrificial lamb, which is the whole, yeah. right, right, right. So it's all about sacrifice. It's all about self-sacrifice, sacrificing your most important value for, so religion is authoritarianism. So you take that and you try to secularize it, and then people say, why? Why should I do that? And there's no answer. It's funny because a lot, no of, a lot of religious people say that oh, atheists, just hedonists, they only care about pleasure and some, pursue that. Some atheists are, but, but this is the difference between general atheism and objectivism. Objectivism has an objectively proven, objectively derived from mm. reality code of morality that if you don't live by, God won't strike you down, but reality will. Mm. And You'll get what you deserve. And with the second part of And the hedonists yeah. don't have fun. Right. They have fun in the short run and they suffer in the long run. You know, if there was a line of cocaine here, yeah, I'd get a high, but I'd long? suffer a long For time. How long? Yeah, exactly. I'd suffer a long time. Yeah, yeah. So, so the, the, the objectivism is a morality to have fun, to have a good life, to have a, to ultimately to achieve happiness over the long run, and it's a set of principles that leads to that. So, um, so yeah, atheists need a source of morality. And, and since they've rejected God as a source of morality, which was never really there because there is no God, the only other source of morality has to be reality. So you have to figure out from reality, from human experience, from knowledge of history, from knowledge of human psychology, what are the things that will lead to a good life? Okay. And so that's, so, so, uh, so I believe in a sense that Ayn Rand is the culmination of secular humanism. In that sense, Ayn Rand is the ultimate secular humanist. She's all about the human being, she's secular, and she is the first thinker uh, in a long line starting in the Renaissance to actually solve all the philosophical problems that, that exist. And I'm not saying everything she said is true or everything she said will be true forever. I don't know of any flaw, if, if th things that are wrong in it, but they might be. Um, the point is that she is in a line of thinkers that start with, in the Greeks, go to the Renaissance, continue through the Enlightenment, then there's an anti-enlightenment, and then she is the resurrection of that enlightenment. In that sense, she is the culmination of the enlightenment, the culmination of, mm. of, the, of the secular humanist. It, it means nothing to me to be a secular humanist today if, you've got, if you have Ayn Rand. Ayn Rand is so much better, so much fuller, so much more complete, so much more interesting, so much more logical and rational that it's a cop-out to be a secular humanist and not be an objectivist. Very interesting. And the last part of that question was, are you translating any of your works into Urdu, Arabic, Farsi? So for the for, for the Muslim so we people? don't uh, we don't translate any of Ayn Rand's works. People in particular countries do the translations of the works, and then they get them published in those works. Uh, so we would definitely support anybody who's interested in in um, in translating Ayn Rand into Farsi yeah. or Arabic. Some of Ayn Rand's essays are translated into Arabic, but they were translated in Israel into Arabic, wow. right? Um, it's in, in, and I, I do think there are people, I, I know I have followers in Saudi Arabia, I know I have followers in Kuwait and in the United Arab Emirates and all of them at least in Arab countries. And, and, but, but imagine if one of them wanted to translate Ayn Rand into Arabic and get it published there. Now maybe in a country like Tunisia that seems to be heading in the right direction, is becoming more secular and is, is, is maybe they could do it there. Maybe there was a time where we thought maybe we could do it in, in Egypt. 
Huh? Maybe in India, because uh, I mean, India, India is technically speaking. But India, you wouldn't translate to everything. Oh, yes, yeah, English. Yeah, and in most yeah. Indian languages, uh, most in Indian languages, Atla Shrugged is already translated. Oh, good. Okay, good. Um, so yeah. Farsi and Arabic are the two languages that it's not. And, and I hope somebody does it. I, mm -hmm. I think it'll be a project. Somebody will do it. I think it's just a matter of time. And I will definitely support it. And I think it's a good idea. Um, most translations are pretty bad. Mm. So it, it can't replace but it's learning English. And re but, it's, but it's better. It's, yeah. it's part of that marketing effort. Very last thought. I know there's many last questions. Very last thought. Sorry, I've taken so much of your time. I've really enjoyed sure. it. Last thought. When you look at the Middle East and you look at the Muslim world, where do you see the future? Next 50 years, 100 years, is it going to get a lot worse or a lot better? Or is it more the same? I think it's really hard to judge. I, I think generally it's going to be more of the same, potentially getting worse. I think there might be some specific spots where it gets better. You know, I hear good things about Tunisia, but who knows? Um, I, I really think that the long-term future of the Middle East is much more likely to be dominated by the Islamists, the radicals, than it is by the secularists. But you never know. People have free will. People are constantly discovering new ideas. You're seeing what's going on in Lebanon right now with people in the streets and, mm -hmm. and re really taking their lives, risking their lives to stand up to, among others, Hezbollah and in, in, in advocating for really more freedom. That's what the Lebanese want. They want less corruption and more freedom. They're not quite ready to challenge religious least, authority, yeah, yeah, but, they, yeah. but they're certainly moving in that direction. It's, it's they're better, I think, than the general Arab Spring. Arab Spring was a, was too, the problem with the Arab Spring was, it wasn't a movement for anything. It was against, mm. against the existing regimes. But it wasn't a secular movement. Arab yeah. Spring in Egypt was dominated by Muslim, Muslim Brotherhood. It was a hodgepodge of everything. Yeah, it was a hodgepodge of everything. Yeah, and of yeah. course, the most consistent elements are the ones who win. So the Arab Spring was won by the Muslim Brotherhood, yeah, and it's yeah. only the Egyptian military that got rid of them ultimately. So, I, I, you know, I, I find it difficult to be optimistic about any place in the world right now. Oh, boy. But that's just a reality. I mean, I look at the United States, it's moving towards statism and to authoritarianism. I look at Europe, it's a complete Mess. unmitigated disaster. I mean, the UK might be in better shape than most, generally. Yeah. I, think, I think that's generally We haven't spoken true. about Brexit, which is not a bad thing, because I'm sick and tired of it. Yeah, I'm sick and tired of yeah, Brexit. Okay, yeah. so, so I think the UK is generally in better mm. situation than most countries. I think you have a better educational system. You, 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 you know, the British know more than most countries. And you've got a certain element of civilization here that is better. Um, but, I, I, you know, China's moving in the wrong direction right now. For years, I was very optimistic about China. And over the last five years, I've shifted. And now it seems like... The Especially what they're more. doing to the Uyghur... Uh, I mean, co uh, well, to Hong Kong, million, but, but also, Hong Kong and the but also t what they're doing to the Muslims in, in, um, in, in Western million, China. But, yeah. but, but more than that, the fact that this president is an authoritarian in a way that his political power has increased, not decreased. The previous presidents were decreasing political power. He's increased it. Uh, you know, the whole social credit system, all these things. And, but you look at South Korea has gone left. Uh, Singapore is even flirting with more socialist policies. Amazing. Uh, the whole world is moving away from what I think is the pinnacle political achievement in human history, and that is the founding of America. The, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution are two most important do political documents in human history. And it, the, the world, including America, moving away from those documents. I'm, I'm, I cannot be optimistic right now about any place in the world. And I think the Middle East is, is, is worse than most in terms of where it is today and probably where it's heading. But, um, and one of the problems is, and I'll end with this, is that the world needs a beacon. It needs hope. It needs somebody to emulate and somebody to strive to be. And America was always that. And, and, and Barack Obama and Donald Trump have done more than any other two presidents in American history to do away with that. Both, both of them don't believe in American exceptionalism. Both of them believe that America is just another country that nobody should emulate us. Yeah, we kill people. Well. Donald Trump would be that kind of When guy. Donald Trump was asked about Putin's killing of journalists, Donald Trump says, yeah, we kill people too. What's the big deal? I mean, literally said that. You can find it on YouTube. Um, Donald Trump's not an American exceptionalism. Donald Trump's America first because they happen to be these borders and he happens to be an American. So America is more important. But he doesn't know what America is. He has no concept of the meaning of America in terms of the ideas behind it. So what the world needs is... I, is, is somebody to emulate. What the Middle East needs is to look up to something to strive towards. And as America is in decline, I think that goes away and it's sad. You're seeing already people wanting to emulate China. Yes. And that is very scary and very, very dangerous. bad. Very dangerous. So, so, you know, to try to end on a positive. Please. 
<laughs> and the positive is that for the, for the first time, certainly since ancient Greece, we have available to us, and really available to all of us, a pro-life, pro-human flourishing, pro-individual happiness philosophy. We have a set of ideas that can free us from history, can free us from the constraint placed on mm. us by religion, that, you know, that all the new atheists were all Christian in their morality. They, they challenged epistemology and their metaphysics and they refused to challenge the morality. Here's a woman who comes about, and yeah, yeah, the atheism stuff is easy. It's the morality stuff that's hard. And, and we have now a philosophical system that turns the world upside down, that really, that, that kind of completes the, what the Founding Fathers of America did. It provides a philosophical foundation for freedom, it provides a philosophical foundation for capitalism, philosophical foundations for liberty. Mm. I mean, the world will be a much better place. The world will be an amazing place if more people embrace this philosophy. So go read Iron Man and it'll change your life and, it'll, it, you know, and, and, and you'll discover, I think you'll discover a whole new world and a whole new potential for human beings that I think has been suppressed constantly by the status, by the Marxists, by the conservatives, by everybody. There is a possibility of human flourishing that is unimaginable to us if we embrace the right ideas. Yaron Brook, it's been an absolute, absolute pleasure. I've really enjoyed Good. it. Please Good. subscribe to your channel. Good awesome. interview, I enjoyed it. I uh, yeah, you're on Brook Show. You're on Brook Show on, on, on YouTube, YouTube or Facebook, on, Twitter. Or in, uh, on podcast app podcast. of your choice. Absolutely. It's been an absolute pleasure. And are you, are you touring elsewhere as well? Or do you want to give I'm some? doing seven countries in seven days starting wow. tomorrow. That's so, amazing. Uh, so you so lots of talks in the next uh, in the next week. Fantastic. It's been a pleasure once again. Yes, absolutely. And I'll hope this to see fun. you soon. Guys, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this. And if you like this, please subscribe and like. I'll see you guys next time. Thank you. Cool.